Hello, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you have sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com. A uh, come a long way, haven't we, <laughs> from the old days. Um, I guess I get to talk about the old days of my channel now. Uh, okay, well, welcome to the show, guys, and we're going to answer some questions. I wanted to throw out a few little things first, of course, as I always do. Um, uh, but I'll make this quick. The first one is that the podcast I put up this week with Aaron Lewis, who is known as the Brazen Atheist on Twitter and is a wonderful person and a, quite a good critical thinker, um, and also had a former life as a stripper. And she has some amazing and interesting things to talk about, both with that career and that industry, which I had a lot of questions about, and about her atheism and skepticism. And we found a lot of common ground there. So I hope you'll give that podcast a listen. I just posted it yesterday. And let's see, I'm probably going to do another live stream this Tuesday. The plan is for me to just, I'm just going to kind of fly solo. I have some things to say about police training that I wanted to get out there. And I haven't really ever had a chance to finish the thought. And I did this pod, this not podcast, but a live stream with my friend this last week, which didn't go exactly as I wanted it to or thought that it would. And so I didn't end up getting a chance to talk about all the things I wanted to with that. And, I, you know, I just got stuff to say about it. So I'm going to put it out there. And this time, since it'll just be me... It won't be the same as a Q&A live stream, but I will be able to see your comments and perhaps respond to some of them as I'm making my various points that I want to make about all that. So if you're interested in that, uh, that'll be uh, streaming. Uh, the plan is that that'll stream this coming up Tuesday. And if you haven't yet uh, seen or checked out the um, weekly call-in show that we are doing, my wife, Melissa, and I... Uh, sit here. We had one week we had Rachel Bernstein guest. I do plan on having more guests on the call-in show also. I understand time is a factor for some of you in order to be able to be part of the show because it's Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock my time. But um, I do encourage folks to come around, check it out. And it's a chance to call in, talk to me, talk to Mel, talk to our guests, and just have an all-around good time. So far, we've been, um, I've been pleased with the results of the show so far, but I would like to uh, you know, get even more uh, out of it and uh, with it and engage with you guys directly. So that's an opportunity to do it. And we're doing it every week on Wednesday nights. So hope to see you there for that. All right. And with those plugs being done, let's now get on with your questions. D.A. Much of what LRH said and wrote is gibberish. But do Scientologists understand it? If you were to look up the misunderstood words, would it make sense within a Scientology context or do Scientologists pretend they get it? Well, you're going to find both, of course. But the thing about the human mind is its capacity to be able to correlate or relate two pieces of information that might have absolutely nothing to do with one another, either logically or physically or, or you know, in reality, but people are able to make those connections. That is um, partly imagination, partly, you know, experience, partly learning. I mean, there's a lot of different labels we use for this stuff, but it's really, really, I've called it the miracle of human thought that we are able to do that because it's both a good and bad thing. You know, we would never be able to have imagination or creative thought or be able to, you know, move any ball down the road progressively if we didn't uh, have the ability to consider new ideas and contemplate them mixed in with other ideas that might not seem to fit and come up with something new. That's pretty cool. But when it comes down to the individual now being indoctrinated or educated into a new belief system, um, you know, there's a thing called cognitive dissonance where you get these, you know, two or more pieces of information and they don't go together. They seem to be mutually exclusive and they and still, still. We are able to invent new reasons or rationalizations or ideas that will justify or rationalize why those two things are not mutually exclusive. And I'll give you an example. What would, what would be an example of that? Well, there's thousands of them. We do it every day, by the way. This is a common, useful, uh, ordinary part of our thinking. It happens all the time, okay? Okay. Um, 
It's just sometimes some of those uh, rationalizations and justifications are kind of a big deal for us. And we have to, and it causes us to then maybe act in ways that are not so wonderful, specifically with cults, of course. So example, Scientology has a creed. I have gone over it here where they have a, a line in the creed that says all men of whatever race, color, creed have the have inalienable rights to think freely, write freely, talk freely, um, uh, their own opinions, and uh, let's see, I'm, I'm not quoting it exactly here. I'm, I'm, I already messed it up, but it's basically all all people have the inalienable, inalienable right to think freely, talk freely, write freely, and to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of others. Okay, so you have this, this the, according to the creed of the Church of Scientology, you have the right, the inalienable right, nobody can take it away from you to be able to write and think and talk freely and to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of others. Well, you have that right all the way up until the point that you start criticizing David Miscavige or L. Ron Hubbard directly, at which point you will be pulled down into a room or if you're in a course room already and you're running across some information, you go, this doesn't seem right. And you, you know, are trying to work it out, and it's not working out, doesn't make sense. And you start saying, well, this just doesn't make sense. A course room supervisor or word clearer or some other Scientologist at some point in time will come up to you or will, will sit down with you and go over how it does make sense, how what L. Ron Hubbard wrote or, or said does make sense universally. And in, and in fact, with the, with the creed here, we could pull that out and say, absolutely, everybody's got that right. Um, however... Then comes this other piece of information to um, that that runs right up against it, which is Scientology will disconnect you. You have to leave Scientology, get kicked out of Scientology if you start talking about it publicly in a in a nasty way. And there's even an ethics justice code in their um, in their great big thick ethics book about how you're not supposed to be bad mouthing Scientology in a public forum. So it's actually a justice justice matter if you start doing that, which is why I got in trouble initially as a Scientologist, because I was doing exactly that, and they don't like that. They consider such activity anti-Scientology, or you're now being an anti-Scientologist, and there's a whole nother set of issues and and writings from Hubbard that, that now come into the picture where you're an anti-social personality because of the fact that you're an anti-Scientologist. And yet, wait a second, I thought I had the right to write counter or, or you know, to write upon or counter the opinions of others. So now I don't have that right. Oh no, you have that right. You have that right. You absolutely have that right. All the way out the door you go with that right. There you go. Bye-bye. No personal freedom or immortality for you. You go have fun enjoying your right to, to counter or utter or write upon the opinions of L. Ron Hubbard or David Miscavige and see how far that gets you in the world of Scientology. So, you know, so yeah, sure, these two things go together, but do they really? No, of course they don't. And that's how you get this push-pull of information, contradictory information within the scriptures of Scientology. So to come back to your question, um, if you look up the misunderstood words, would it still make sense within a Scientology context? Well, if you sort of do the mental gymnastics to make those two things I just described make sense to you, then yes, within a Scientology context, you can make it make sense. But from a more objective point of view, it doesn't make sense because it's contradictory, right? You can't have the right to speak freely, talk freely, and write freely upon whatever you want, but then get kicked out for doing so. These two things are, you know, they don't go well together, but Scientologists do reconcile those things. And that's just one of many kind of, you know, such reconciliations they have to make while going through Hubbard's materials. And that's what we call a Scientology education. <laughs> is working that stuff out, you know, and there's not a lot of, you know, pick and choose, you can take this, you can't take that, you know, there's, there's, uh, you don't, you don't have to take this, but you have to, you know, but, but this is okay. It's all or nothing with Scientology is what I'm trying to say there. Um, so, Anyway, that's kind of how it works. Um, and it's like that in all, um, you know, the, 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 the power of choice 
over whether you accept a piece of information from L. Ron Hubbard or not is um, is not really there. You know, I mean, do, do Scientologists reject some of Hubbard's information? Yes, of course they do. Everybody's individual. Everybody's got their own thing. My mom, for example, was a registered pediatric nurse growing while I was growing up, and she was getting into Scientology and started working for the organization. And she told me flat out, um, after years after the fact, that she had never agreed with or bought into L. Ron Hubbard's um, criticisms of psychiatry and psychology. She didn't buy into it. She didn't think it was that bad. She knew psychologists. She knew psychiatrists. She worked with them. And she knew that they were not all evil, you know, mustache twirling. Nah, 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 we're going to do away with this world. That's what we're going to do. We're going to destroy everything. You know, she knew they weren't like that. But, you know, Hubbard kept insisting they were. So she was able to reject that because her real world experience countered it too much. But in the grand scheme of things, it was okay because that wasn't a real big thing when she was in Scientology. CCHR and the whole anti-psychiatry movement really ramped up quite a bit under David Miscavige. So it existed under L. Ron Hubbard. He made sure that that was happening. Um, but it wasn't really in her face the way it, it developed into the way it was in my face when I was in Scientology and in the Sea Org. So she was safely able to sort of, you know, park that one to the side and continue to accept and follow the mainline teachings of L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology, and so she got along fine. But if you start, uh, you know, countering, well, this reactive mind thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't think that thing exists. And if they can't reconcile you around to, you know, through going over the words, going over the concepts, you know, demonstrating it, working out examples of it, if they can't get you to see that that's a thing, that the reactive mind is real and exists, and there's engrams and locks and secondaries and, and and you're going to go into session, you're going to run this stuff out, and it's going to make your life better, and it's going to change everything for you. If you can't ever buy into the existence of that, you know, you're probably going to be out the door before too long, because that's a basic foundational principle of Dianetics and Scientology. You can't really do Dianetics and Scientology if you don't acknowledge the reactive mind is real. So... You know, so data in Scientology has relative importances, and so not everything equals everything, and there, that's how it works. So anyway, I hope that helps clarify and answer your question. Thanks for asking. Christopher Weiss. I recently came across this Sea Org recruitment flyer, which briefly explains the Sea Org logo. The star above a laurel wreath, according to this flyer, is supposed to represent the Galactic Confederation, of which Earth was once part, along with the number of stars belonging to said Galactic Confederation. What would a preclear even know about the Galactic Confederation narrative? Isn't this a part of the OT3 materials? Okay, Chris, thanks for asking this question, and I'm just going to run with this now. I have threatened many times to go into Hubbard's literature and give it to you guys straight and just tell you some of the stuff that people are exposed to, and I've talked about the cosmology or mythology of Scientology and how it's kind of a disparate collection of various one-liners and stories Hubbard told over the years that we kind of merged and put together and figured out in our own heads as we went along as to what what this picture really looked like. And the Xenu narrative, the OT3 story of the, of the galactic genocide, is probably one of the more coherent story narratives within that broader collection of myths and, and one-liners and, and, like I said, little stories and, and anecdotes that Hubbard would tell. So that's one reason why it gains traction. It's also confidential, so you don't get exposed to that Xenu stuff until you've paid an awful lot of money. Um, and it's sensational. It sounds wild. It sounds insane, right? So people love talking about it, even though it's really only, you know, a little tiny part of this bigger picture. So what else is in this bigger picture? Well, let me share some things with you, because I thought you guys might find this interesting and maybe educational as far as um, what Scientology is all about. I mean, that Sea Org symbol, the wreath and the star and stuff, I mean, we used to take that stuff seriously. I thought that was, when I learned about that, I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. You know, that symbol means a lot more than I thought it did. 
And that's only the tip of the iceberg. So if you, there's a dictionary in Scientology called the Technical Dictionary, which defines all of the technical stuff that's used in auditing or in training, different from the administrative words that Hubbard invented for running the organization. That's the Administrative Dictionary, and that's another whole book. The Technical Dictionary is basically just a collection of quotes and definitions that Hubbard from directly from Hubbard's works. So um, there is, and this is not confidential, this technical dictionary is any Scientologist can buy it. In fact, every Scientologist has to end up buying one. I think there's a newer dictionary now, um, or there will be one, but as far, I don't know if this is still in use, but the quotes from it are, and the information in it has always been available to all Scientologists, so this is why I'm showing it to you. Galactic Confederacy is one of the terms defined in the technical dictionary, okay? Anybody has access to it. And the definition doesn't mention Xenu at all, of course. What it says is, the former political unit of which the, the solar system was part. That's it. The Galactic Confederacy, the former political unit of which the solar system was a part. Obviously, he's referring to this solar system. And that comes from um, the L. Ron Hubbard definition notes. So when he was asked, what's a definition we can use for this? That's what he jotted down, and that's what's in the dictionary. So, um, so that's the exposure that people have to the Galactic Confederacy until they do the Xenu thing. But there's more. There's another term that is often bandied about uh, when people start talking about the, the space incidents, the stuff, the, the space drama or space opera or the past track or whole track. There's a lot of terms in Scientology for what happened before. And um, another term that gets thrown around is the Markab Confederacy which is uh, another name for the Galactic Confederacy in some places. I, I, I've heard other things about the Galactic Confederacy, but when I was coming along as a Scientologist and Sea Org member, I had the two things understood as the same or very, very similar. So let me read you the definition of the Markab Confederacy right out of the Tech Dictionary. And again, I'll remind you, it is available to every Scientologist at every level. The Markab Confederacy, definition. Various planets united into a very vast civilization which has come forward up through the last 200,000 years is formed out of the fragments of earlier civilizations. In the last 10,000 years, they have gone on with a sort of decadent kicked in the head civilization that contains automobiles, business suits, fedora hats, and telephones, spaceships. A civilization which looks almost exact duplicate but is worse off than the current U.S. civilization. And that's a definition from a lecture that Hubbard gave in, Mar in sorry, August of 1963 at St. Hill in England. So, um, is it exactly the same thing as the Galactic Confederacy? Well, maybe, maybe not. Depends on which one you're talking about uh, and when. So, he, so this is a pretty wild claim here that there is this confederacy of planets out there that um, are various planets, but more than one planet, and they've got this kicked in the head civilization and they've been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. So I used to read this stuff out of the tech dictionary and go, oh, man, what else is there to know that I that he's not saying, right? Because all the OTs in my life, like my parents or other OTs I met, would hint. They, they I think they kind of got off on it, actually, you know, sometimes they would sort of hint up at, you know, well, there's a lot more here than you think, and you'll learn about it when you're ready, when you get to the, you know, to the confidential levels. Now, just for fun, Again, because I've been threatening to do this forever, and I'm finally doing it now, I thought you also might enjoy a couple other readings from the scriptures. And this goes back to 1952. This is out of a book called a Scientology, A History of Man. And this little book is chock-a-block full of stuff like this. Now, this 
contains a chapter which talks about the principal incidents um, in our past. Specific incidents on the theta line, it says. Now, the theta line meaning that a thetan, a spiritual entity, is you know moving through time and space, and that's the theta line. And a thetan goes from one body to the next to the next, but there are times when a thetan doesn't have a body at all. And there are times in the past where bodies have been very different than they are on Earth right now, or they were utilized in different ways. Um, and sometimes they were used as, as little devices to be able to punish a person, as a spiritual entity or a thetan, for example. So Hubbard talks about various incidents in the past, and one of them is the coffee grinder. Um, he says here, and I'm just going to read this straight out of History of Man to you. The coffee grinder is leveled at the preclear, and a push-pull wave is played over him, first on his left side, then on his right, and back and forth from side to side, laying in a bone-deep somatic physical pain sensation, which cannot be run unless you recognize it as a vibration, not the solid board it seems to be. When this treatment is done, the preclear is dumped in scalding water, then immediately in ice water. Then the preclear is put in a chair and whirled around. He was quite swollen after the pummeling of the waves and was generally kept in a badly run but quite modern hospital for a few days. Sometimes he was given several treatments and after the first one would report back on schedule for the next. And uh, this coffee grinder is part of this other incident called FAC-1 or facsimile-1. Facsimile in Scientology is a word that means a mental image picture, a, a thought, a memory. And FAC-1 is supposed to not be the very first picture you've ever had, but the first one that they came across where they had these implant type things going on. See, the coffee grinder is not something that happened to you yesterday. It's something that happened to you millions of years ago. Ago. Numerous times. It happened over and over again. This is a way of controlling populations, see? And they mess up you, not your body. They take your body, but they mess you as a thetan up. They're trying to implant, they're trying to control you as a spiritual entity, see? So, FAC1, Hubbard says, was an outright control mechanism invented to cut down rebel raids on invader installations. Okay, so here you have invader forces, these, these races or species of creatures that would come and invade solar systems or planets and take over. And Earth was once caught up between wars between various invader forces. And so these mechanisms or these traps or implants were used kind of similar to how we might think government uses mind control now. Um, through propaganda or, you know, say, MK Ultra, some of the, you know, brainwashing, all that kind of stuff. Um, the idea here is that this is a, you know, uh, an earlier and much more powerful version of brainwashing that you would use on thetans, on spirits. And you would use it via their body or directly on the thetan if you had the right electronics to hit the thetan directly. So FAC1 was this control mechanism. And um, it was probably designed by the fourth invader, because there were various, they, Hubbard differentiated the invader forces by number. There was first, second, third, fourth, I think up to like seventh invader force. And he says it was probably designed by the fourth invader and used by him in its an original state and ritual for a considerable time. It gave him a nice, non-combative, religiously insane community. Okay, so the idea was you would do this on a bunch of people, not just one, and you get this, you know, religiously insane but very chill, non-combative, you know, rebel. These guys were rebelling against the invader force, and now they're all about, you know, supporting the invader force, and they've been implanted with this coffee grinder and FAC1 stuff. So, um, so I thought you would find that interesting, and there's a lot more detail I could go into. Now, that's 1952 writing, okay? So that sounds pretty wild. You'll notice that Hubbard didn't actually assign dates specifically to the coffee grinder or FAC1 because he said they were used over and over again, and he didn't exactly lay out when precisely. So you could sort of, 
you know, look for these incidents and find them in lots of different places, depending on how you answered the questions in your auditing sessions about when it happened. But then in 1963, and I'll wrap up with this stuff, uh, Hubbard had advanced his mythology or cosmology to now having very, very, very specific incidents of control that were placed on Thetans that happened in very exact time periods or stretches of time. And, for example, you have... All of these were incidents that were designed to implant false goals or purposes in people so that they would, you know, head off as a Thetan to, you know, solve crime or uh, be a good guy or whatever the goal was that was being implanted in the person by the implant. Okay, and these are all different kinds of implants. And here's one, the gorilla goals. (laughs) Okay, this... uh, Given in an amusement park, okay, so imagine trillions of years ago, there somebody set up an amusement park type installation. Okay, that's literally what Hubbard is saying. This is not metaphorical. He's being, he's talking literally about what happened to us in our distant past. He says there's this amusement park with a single tunnel, a roller coaster, and a Ferris wheel. And it was used between about 319 trillion years ago to about 256 trillion trillion years ago. A long span, he says. Yeah, no shit, right? The symbol of a gorilla was always present in the place the goal was given. Sometimes a large gorilla, black, was seen elsewhere than the park. A mechanical or a live gorilla was always seen in the park. This activity was conducted by the Hoi Polloi, a group of operators in meat body societies. In other words, they had, you know, like human like meat bodies. He uses that to differentiate from uh, robot bodies or android bodies or like Terminator bodies. Because you know, Hubbard said in the past you had uh, doll bodies. That's what he really, that's what he had, that's how he referred to them. But he was talking about androids or robots that Thetans could occupy just as easily as they could occupy a meat body, see? And he says that this activity was a, you know, a group of operators. They were typically, they were typical carnival people. They let out concessions for these implant amusement parks. A pink-striped white shirt with sleeve garters was the uniform of the Hoi Polloi. Such a figure often rode on the roller coaster cars. Monkeys were also used on the cars. Elephants sometimes formed part of the equipment. The Hoi Polloi, or Gorilla Goals, were laid in with fantastic motion. Blasts of raw electricity and explosions were both used to lay the items in. Uh, And he says here, the series is always five goals. They're very simple goals, no long words. To end, to be dead, to be asleep, to be solid, to create, to find, to be visible, to be sexual, to be invisible, And a few more were used, always five goals in a series. So I guess they would select from amongst that list of things. They also had to sleep, to be asleep. So these were goals that were implanted in people, okay? And this is why you now have obsessions about religion and sex and government and compliance and all this other stuff. Hubbard's explanations for that are that they all come from this. And this gorilla goals is just one of about five or six different sets of goals that he describes in this 1963 bulletin, which is not confidential. It's available to any Scientologist who wants to open up one of the technical volumes and read it. So getting back to your wonderful question here, um, Chris, this is the sort of thing, you know, what would a preclear even know about the Galactic Confederation narrative? Well, he wouldn't know anything about Xenu. In all the time that I was in Scientology, I never once heard the word Xenu uttered by L. Ron Hubbard or any other Scientologist because it's confidential. But I read all about gorilla goals and aircraft goals and bear goals and uh, coffee grinders and FAC one and all kinds of other incidents, the boohoo and the weeper and the this and the that. 
um, in these various non-confidential materials, okay? And I would just eat this stuff up because I thought that it was all based on research Hubbard had done in auditing himself and auditing other people so that they this is the stuff they would describe in their auditing sessions, and Hubbard would take it as fact and just go, oh, okay, that's what happened. And uh, then he would write this stuff up. And his method of auditing people always included leading questions. So he would lead them into these preformed ideas he had about what was going on. And then they would come up with and generate this stuff out of their imagination and out of his sort of prompting. And that's how he would come up with the stuff and claim that it, it was real and it was literal and it was true. So, okay, so there you go. Um, so no, a Scientologist is not going to know about the Xenu narrative until he gets there, but he is going to know about all this other crazy stuff, and he's going to have it all flipping around in his head wondering what's what. And that was me for many years while I was in Scientology. So, all right, threat has now been... <laughs> <laughs> made real. I have now dived deep into some of the scriptures of Scientology for you, and I hope you found that interesting. Hey, everyone. I want to introduce you to a new sponsor for my show, which I think is a vital service that especially now is something we might all want to avail ourselves of, and that is better help. If you are feeling anxious or sad or just want someone to talk to, who better than a licensed professional therapist? I know in the past there was some controversy with this, but that's been addressed, and I'm happy to endorse this service now. BetterHelp is a professional service which will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in under 24 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in your area. This is actually a worldwide service, not just here in the U.S. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions at your convenience instead of having to wait on theirs. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. I endorse this service, but check it out for yourself. Visit their website and read their testimonials. And if you sign up using my special URL, you'll get 10% off your first month. Look them up at betterhelp.com slash Chris Shelton. Pretty easy to remember, right? That's betterhelp.com slash Chris Shelton. Sign up today. And Bill's. I'm wondering what you think about the show Cops and Live PD being canceled, and I've heard of a kid's show being canceled. I'm just curious about what your opinions are. Thanks for the question, Anne. I um, generally will have a pushback reaction to sudden social change that demands that there be a sudden cessation of an activity, because that's usually coming out of the emotional knee-jerk reactions of people who are kicking back reflexively against things that they think are problematic, which is another word I kind of hate, but, you know, that are going to create problems or could potentially, possibly, maybe create problems. Problems or could potentially maybe in some, you know, some fever dream of some kind, maybe these things would be offensive to someone, okay? And I think we all know what I'm talking about when I start using that language because now we're getting into the extremes on both ends of spectrums so that you want to look at uh, political spectrums or whatever. This isn't even a political statement. I, I hate framing everything politically. I'm kind of sick and sick of doing that. Um, but the knee-jerk reaction to the cops right now, for example, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm doing whole shows on this, right? Because it's a complicated, nuanced topic. It's, yeah, there's a lot of things wrong with what the cops are doing. But if you think that solving that is going to solve all the problems that 
um, minorities are experiencing, that cops are doing, that we have in society. I mean, come on. It's not even remotely the, the problem that we should be, you know, facing head on. There are... Um, it's part of the problem. You know, if people hear me say that and think I'm pushing back and, well, there's no problem. I didn't say that. There's lots of problems. And, um, and I got a lot to say about those problems and how we might go about solving them if we're only going to tunnel vision in on the cops. But what about the courts? Ain't nobody talking about the courts right now. What about the prisons? You want to talk about slave labor? Let's talk about the prisons. That's where slave labor is alive and well today in America. And I mean real slave labor. But nobody's talking about that. And yet those two things are two of the three-part justice system that we have in the United States. And, and two of them are, are being completely ignored right now. Why? Why just the cops, right? Because it's the most visible thing. You can see them. They're on the streets. They're right in front of you all the time, especially when you're doing protests. And sometimes they do crappy stuff during protests because of a lot of reasons. Racism is one of those reasons. But to think that that's the all-inclusive answer to this and that that's what's driving all the problems that exist with our police or with our justice system is straight up delusional. That's not the only problem. And it's not even the biggest problem. It's a problem. I'm glad it's getting some attention. Maybe we can actually do something about that aspect of it. But let's not kid ourselves that we're really going to be solving the big problems that we want to solve with this. We're not going to be solving the socioeconomic problems that are driving all of this or the underlying real underlying huge problem, which is that there are communities in the United States that have no chance at opportunity. Those communities are being denied opportunities. They've literally been stripped of opportunity and doesn't you can throw money at it, you can you know change you can throw race awareness training at it, gender awareness training at it all day long. And you're not going to provide any more opportunity to those communities. And those communities are not just black communities. They are, there are, the zip codes are definitely those communities, but they also include white trash communities, um, Latino communities, Mexican communities. Uh, any poor, you know, socioeconomically challenged community is going to fall under this business of, you know, not what they are poor of is opportunity. And we need to solve that. And it's not just, you know, a matter of there are people stepping on their necks and that's the only thing going on. There's there's lots of other issues here. So, um, so that being my little soapbox about this, you know, basically meaning all I'm really trying to say is, yeah, that's a problem. But actually, let's look at this bigger picture problem and let's see if we might do something about some of that. So my opinion about cops and live PD and shows getting canceled and stuff is it's 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 fine. I mean, I don't watch cops. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, talk about the necessity of having a show on every week where we get to watch cops act stupid or incompetently or competently sometimes. Um you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to defend it. I'm not going to attack it. I'm going to say, well, I understand. Yeah, people are pissed off at cops right now. And so there's these reactions to it. They should be pissed at cops. Cops are doing some pretty stupid stuff. Our whole system is designed to do a particular thing. And it's doing that. And we need to we need to change the course of that train, you know, a um, lot to that. There's a whole lot to that. It's a lot more complicated than, you know, taking away cops' ability to do chokeholds. That's not going to solve anything. I can tell you that right now. That's only going to make it worse. So, um, anyway, so those are some of my opinions. <laughs> I'm sure some people are really pissed at me right now, but whatever, you know, uh, if we really want to talk about real solutions to this thing, then we need to get real serious about what the actual problems are. And racism is a problem, but it is not the problem. And that is, it's more of, well, that's all I really want to say about that. So anyway, thanks for asking, Ian. Katie LaSalle. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to live in San Diego for a while, and my workplace was near Scientology's downtown office. My bus dropped me off exactly in front of their doorstep. I remember watching staff members walking into the building or waiting outside if they arrived early. 
They looked exhausted and drained. Knowing what I know, I so badly wanted to help wake those people up, but I also knew they have to be ready to listen slash leave. They need to be willing, be open, and ready to change. Throwing Xenu at them won't help either. I was also scared that they might chase me down and harass me. I can't imagine how painful it must be for people who escape Scientology to watch the ones still inside, trapped by their prison of belief. Even an ordinary person like me felt awful watching them. What are your current feelings about the staff and Sea Org members? Do you have ways to hear how they are doing inside? Are they all right during the lockdown? Thanks for the question, Katie. Uh, as far as I know, the staff uh, of the, and the Sea Org members are doing all right. You know, I had predicted early on that there would be trouble on the PAC base, but we haven't heard any word one way or the other out of there. It could be a meltdown or it could have been a, a tremendous success. I really don't know. Um, they're so non-transparent, and it's not like I've got contacts on the PAC base who call me with information, okay? I've, I've got some inside lines that prop up every now and again. I get people that give me information, but, you know, I'm not really working hard on developing those lines anymore. I mean, you know, I talk about Scientology. I've got a lot of things to say about it, but you notice I'm also moving on to bigger and broader topics that I think are much more um, have a lot more appeal to a lot more people and can take these lessons of Scientology and apply them to, you know, these larger groups, other groups, other practices, and things outside of even, you know, just straight up destructive cults and religious groups. And let's talk about how these principles apply in, in lots of different places. So that's kind of, that's why you don't see me, you know, dishing on all the minutia of Scientology is because I, I, I haven't eschewed it. I'm still very interested in what's going on there. I just don't hear as much as I used to because I put, used to put a lot more direct attention on that world. Um, okay, so what are my current feelings about the staff and Sea Org? Um, I basically feel sorry for them. I mean, I've certainly, you know, had that experience at the staff and Sea Org level. It's awful. There's, there's never, there's nothing good about that experience, really. You know, you, you have ups and downs. You have moments of, of wins and excitement and all that because that's what Scientology does to you. Is it, is it pushes you up? And then you come crashing back down to reality and it pushes you back up again. It's kind of like having a, you know, living with a motivational speaker. They're always pumping you up. They're always on. And, or, and if they're not on, they're pretending to be on so that they can have this happy life that is a fake life. And, and I feel sorry for people who have to feel like they have to limit themselves and their thinking to this tunnel of authorized, approved thoughts and limit their actions to these things that are authorized and approved by the church and you can't do anything else than that. Otherwise, you're guilty of a sin, you know, you have, of an overt, you've done something wrong and you have to withhold it and then you feel bad and then you feel, oh gee, and then there's the confessions and the constant, constant confessions that go on in that group keep you in this mindset of guilt you're constantly apologizing in your own mind for your very existence is what it feels like sometimes, as especially as a Sea Org member. And that's, I wouldn't really, you know, who wants to live a life like that? And the, and the real tragedy is they feel like they have to do that because they're saving the world. They, they, these are the sacrifices they have to make in order to make a better world for all of us. It's, anyway, it's really sad. And, of course, then you have, even if they are getting auditing or training in Scientology, that's just giving them a little brief, you know, respite from the, from the torture of it. And then they get right back into it again, you know. And so that becomes its own sort of auditing, especially, kind of becomes its own little mini addiction. You know, you really get kind of hooked on it. And because um, you get these... You know these dopamine rushes and and uh, and the uh, you know the neurotransmitters start flying and you start feeling really amazing, and you're imagining things like what I was just talking about in a couple of questions ago, right? You're imagining that you're learning the truth about the gorilla goals. Oh, that's why I'm so obsessed about sex is because a gorilla implanted me, you know, in an amusement park, 200 trillion trillion years ago, right? I mean. 
the Scientologists really think, and the staff and the Sea Org are the most dedicated, right? So they really believe this stuff is literal truth. And they think when they read about this stuff and uncover it in their auditing sessions that, that, they're, that they're discovering the reality that has been hidden from them. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's bad. So I feel bad for them. And when I see them lashing out against people like me or, you know, the, the stuff they do, I just, I, I can't even get mad about it anymore. It's just, ugh, how sad, you know? I mean, in my, in my nicer moments, <laughs> at least I can say I feel that way. So um, anyway, so thanks for the question, Katie. I think, that's a, I think that's a pretty good answer there for you. Brittany Gatchel. I know you didn't really experience indoctrination as a child, but I'm curious as to if you feel like there are some ideas you learned in Scientology that still stick with you today. There may be some things that you intellectually understand are incorrect, but are there some things that have just stayed with you? Thanks for the question, Brittany. And the reason I want to take this up is because I don't know that I've ever clearly on this show differentiated my ideas about indoctrination versus education. I've talked about this recently with um, Benjamin Boyce on hit on uh, a podcast we did that'll be coming, I think, next week. And I've, I've dropped this in a couple other places and in interviews and talks with other people. But let me say that I was indoctrinated as a child into Scientology. I mean, there was no question about that. I was taught, and, and, and by indoctrination, I mean... I was force-fed a series of ideas about life and myself that I had no ability to think critically about. And that's indoctrination. When you, when you are not invited to or not able to think about the information that's being given to you in a critical fashion, question it, chew on it, look at it, you know, see how it might work, how it might not work, where it's applicable, where it's not applicable. That's critical thinking about an idea. And indoctrination is the opposite of that. It is, here is this idea. It is true. I don't care what you think about it. It's true. And you're going to accept it. And some degree of social pressure, parental pressure, societal pressure is put on you to accept that piece of information uncritically. Don't think about it. Or, with children, and this is where I really feel very strongly about this, with children, when you indoctrinate them in religious principles, about which are faith-based ideas that they cannot think critically about yet because they simply their brain hasn't grown enough and they haven't had enough experience to learn how to think critically. I'm talking about five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. You know, they're barely getting up to the point at that level where they're, where they're really th able to think thoughts through. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to infantilize, you know, 9 or 10-year-olds, but, you know, let's, let's look at what they can and can't think with, what their experiences cover and what they don't. If you start feeding a 4-year-old, a 5-year-old, this is how the world is, you really need to be careful about what information you're putting into that, that sponge that is just absorbing everything that's coming in and accepting it and look, and, and this is truth. This is how it is, right? When you indoctrinate a child with times tables, with division, with how to do long division and stuff, you're giving them, you know, clear-cut methods to figure things out. You have to indoctrinate them. You're not asking them to think about it. You're saying two times two equals four. Memorize that, right? Three times three equals nine. Memorize that. That's just how it is. There, there's no questioning that. And that's how I learned my times tables. And, you know, and, and uh, that's how I learned what the sounds of my language are and how to read. You know, it, was, it wasn't a matter of here's the word. What do you think about it? It's that's the word. That's how you say it, right? So that's indoctrination. It doesn't have to be bad. I'm trying to point out that it doesn't have a value connected with it, and it's how you use it as to whether it's good or bad. And, and religious indoctrination that happened to me laid in the ideas that I was an immortal spiritual being who was going to live forever and had lived near infinite into the past. That there was that there, I learned early on as a child from my dad that there were things going on in the universe around us involving these invader forces and and space opera and stuff that were very very real, and um, 
And it, they they really, I was very, very curious about that stuff. And my dad would only tell me so much. And then he'd be like, well, I can't tell you anymore. You're going to get sick. And I'd be like, oh, well, then why'd you tell me anything at all, right? Um, and, of course, he was alluding to, you know, the Xenu story or other things that he had learned, you know, that were confidential. And he wouldn't, he would lead me right up to the door, but he wouldn't let me, you know, he wouldn't take me through because uh, he was being a good Scientologist. So these were ideas that I've had from a very, very young age. The idea that I have a reactive mind. There's some part of my mind that is evil and, and, it, and it makes me act evil. And the only way to deal with that reactive mind is to sort of shove it aside and not operate with it whatever that's supposed to mean. I'm just supposed to sort of figure that out. This was as a kid. I was told, don't be banky. Put your reactive mind on the shelf. You know, stop being banky. And the bank being another term for the reactive mind. So this was how I was raised. These were, this was how I would be controlled as a child, right? If I was having a tantrum or something, stop being banky. It was instantly assigned to this, you know, sort of nameless shape or not nameless, but shapeless, you know, sort of energy field or something. I didn't even understand it that well. And um, yet I was sure that these things were true. I was told that the brain is just a switchboard between me, my body, and my Thetan, me as a, as a spiritual entity, right, who I really am. So I'm controlling the body via the brain, which is just a switchboard that's receiving my spiritual commands or something. I didn't even understand it that much. I was just sort of like, what? okay, you know, so the brain was a switchboard. This was something that was told to me. Because before I even really understood what a brain was. <laughs> you know? um, these were points of indoctrination, and they stuck with me for a really long time. You know, that's the point of indoctrination, is to lay in ideas that are always going to be there. And everything else is going to align to those things. And when that happens, you know, to adults... Um, and they're not, you know, and their power of choice isn't consulted and their critical thinking is disavowed or not allowed at all, then um, you have drones, you have cult members. And, and that's not, you know, that's not, a, it's not a, the basis of a rational society. At least we can say that. So, um, so you asked, you know, are there some things that I, that I understood as intellectually incorrect, but that still stick with me? Yeah, the the whole concept of what a spiritual existence is, is informed by that. I, I, I don't have another idea of what a spiritual existence might be. It's, I've had to really use my imagination to think outside that box that was kind of created for me as a child as to how to think about these things. I have since uneducated myself out of the whole reactive mind nonsense, but the spirituality question still sits there because it's it's a faith based question. You can't you know you can't really objectively scientifically break that thing down and take it apart. So you know so what do I do with that? Well, like I've said, it just sort of sits there as kind of a hope of like wow that would be that'd be kind of great. Now I'm not so sure. You know, now I now I have doubts even about that as I've lived more life and thought about this more and you know thought about what it would be like to live forever and realizing that that ain't such a great existence if if it's in a human context stuff like that you know so um so some of this stuff still sticks with me because I, I i just don't know another way to think about these things you know and uh as i learn more and grow and and uh talk to other people about it i get other ideas and ways of thinking about these things and it's always oh wow i hadn't thought about it that way you know and i love that that's a that's a that's a wonderful way to 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 go through and, and learn things and reevaluate stuff so um so it's an ongoing process for me but um but i just thought i would would be clear about that indoctrination versus education point because i thought that would be um you know useful to share with you guys so there you go all right it is time for flash answers kevin zay what percentage of active Scientologists today would fall under the PIMO, or physically in, mentally out, category? Kevin, I'm going to tell you, I literally don't know. So my supposition is, of the existing Scientologists now, I'm going to venture to say a quarter of them. 
are physically in, mentally out. Are they are those those people I've referred to in the past many times as those who are still there because their family or friends or you know contacts are still in Scientology, all in, and they can't leave because if they do, they'll have to disconnect from them, or if they speak up or speak their mind, they'll have to uh, suffer some consequences. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say twenty five percent. I don't know. It might be really interesting if we could actually find out, but I have, there's no way of determining that uh, really without a broad survey, and Scientologists are never going to answer that. John Jones, if, as you believe, Miscavige no longer believes in Scientology, then what's stopping him from simply inventing new OT levels? Absolutely nothing. And eventually that is what's going to have to happen. Dr. Robert Tobias, when you were in the Sea Org, if you had been ordered by a superior to kill an enemy of the Church of Scientology, would you have done it? No, I don't think I ever would have gotten to a place where I would have killed somebody. I've thought about this a lot, actually, and I might have even said I thought I, I might have at some point. I will say that I could have been ramped up. There were certain points in time when I was in the Sea Org, like when I first joined, um, Certain times when I was still in management, then my first eight years when I was in, before I kind of saw behind the curtain, started seeing behind the curtain a little bit, um, when you could have ramped me up to that level. As a staff member, no, I never would have been able to get to that level of, of you know, let's kill somebody. Um, but as a Sea Org member, I think there were a couple times when if they had taken me and, you know, pumped me up and, and done more then I might have been able to get to that headspace. But I, I was never in that headspace just through my normal experience of Scientology. However, I was in the headspace through a lot of that time where I would have taken a bullet for Miscavige or, you know, I, I, theoretically for Hubbard. Uh, I absolutely would have died for Scientology. There were definite times when that was absolutely true, many times. So, yeah, so there you go. Okay, guys, thanks for these questions. I really had a good time answering this week. I hope you guys had a good time listening to me go on about them. Um, you know, and I just want to say also that... Um, I'm having a lot of fun with this channel, and I hope you guys are having fun, you know, going along on the ride here with me. Um, I really want to, you know, do more with this channel to try to appeal more broadly to people, and I would love to have your input as to how you think I might accomplish that um, without necessarily changing everything I'm already doing. Um, you know, I've got a weekly Q&A show. I've got a weekly podcast. I'm doing a weekly call-in show, so you're, you know, you're getting three episodes a week out of me, plus I'm doing, you know, live streams fairly frequently. I'm not going to guarantee I'm always going to do them on Tuesdays, but so far that's what's been happening. And of course, you've got the critical clips coming out uh, every day that I'm not doing this other content. So is there anything you guys think I could do or should do that might make my channel appeal more broadly? That's the question. And I'm interested in your answers. So with that, excuse me, if you find this channel useful, entertaining, informative, educational, then please support me through Patreon. Please. It would really help. Um, I got to keep these lights on. I want to keep this show going for you guys. I want to keep this channel moving and growing. And um, and I need your support to do it. I just do. YouTube's income is just tanking right now. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And um, I'm there, I'm not under threat of shutting down or anything right now. But um, but I am saying that it would be really helpful if I had a little bit more support out there. So if you find this content useful or uh, anything like that, then consider joining me on Patreon. All right, guys. Thank you very much. See you next week. Bye bye.